So I'd like to start today talking about the Kubernetes for Java developers. Those that want to take a seat, feel free. You are all welcome to stay and see the session. My name is Rafael Benevides. Let me introduce myself. I work at Red Hat as a director of developer experience. Uh, my role in Red Hat is to help developers to be more productive with open source tools in, in general, and especially with Red Hat technologies. If you can get in touch with me by my email address, which is rafabene, uh, benevides at redhat.com, but you can also find me and, and follow in Twitter. I will really appreciate if you have feedback of this session uh, by using my Twitter handle, rafabene. I've been a Java developer for a while, and now I'm more, much more involved with containers. And that's why I like to talk to you today. But before that, I'd like to invite you to do join the MicroProfile lunch that will ha happen on Thursday, 11.30 to 2 p.m. And also invite you to join the Red Hat Developers Portal, which is a portal that provides uh, Valu valuable resources for developers, like free access to products, uh, free ebooks, um, blog posts, any kind of resources that can make your life easier. So let's uh, start ver focusing on our main subject here, which is place your application, your Java application inside containers and how it can be orchestrated and managed by Kubernetes. Let me start with a question. Uh, have you any one of you run uh, ran a um, Java application inside a container or ever used a Docker container? The question is, is that Java supposed to be portable between environments? Why would you put your Java application inside containers? Well, of course, we have a lot of advantages when we run inside containers. We have, uh, we can not only amp, the, amp your application, but you can place your, uh, uh, your application server configured with data sources, with files, environment variables, package everything together, and that will be uh, an isolated process that you can send to the production. But we have a lot of problems when, for example, when we run Docker run and the name of the image, you have a single process running in a single machine. But what happens when you have a lot of containers running in multiple machines? How would you handle port conflicts? How would you know what versions of these containers are running? How will do you update them? So to solve that problem, I'd like to introduce you to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a project from Google, and it uses the Google expertise with containers. Uh, they use an internal project called Borg, but they got that knowledge and released, it, released it, this open source project that manages containers. So instead of talking, I'd like to show you how that works. I have here uh, an application, a Java application, that there is a PON XML file. It's, by the way, it's a micro profile application that I want to build the application, build the, the fetch jar, and place that inside a Docker image. So that's what I'm doing now. As you can see, it's a pure Maven build. It's compiling all the Java sources. It's producing a WAR file. But now with the Wildfly Swarm plugin, I will get this WAR file and place it together with the Wildfly and create a fetch jar. Now that I have this fetch jar, this Wildfly Swarm fetch jar, I am embedded this inside a container that has already the, open, uh, uh, the Java Open JDK. I'm setting up, setting up an environment variable, and now I have this image running. 
for those of you who ever used Docker containers, can you give me a tip how can I run this in a Docker container? L let's do it together. We would do Docker run, right? The next thing is dash D to create a detached process. Then it's also good practice to give it a name. This is a, the guestbook service, so I would call it guestbook service, right? And plus the name of the image, right? To run that with Kubernetes, I do, I can, I replace Kubernetes by kubectl run. I don't need to specify the dash d because it will already create a, a detached process. The name is the second parameter, and the name of the image will be the third parameter. So it, as you can see, it's very similar. But I can also specify that I want, I want two replicas of this container running. So once that I execute it, it will create a replication controller. Let's see how that behaves inside OpenShift. As you can see here, I created two containers running. Each one of these containers has its own IP address. So this is the IP, IP, it has the IP 172.05, 172.04. I can do a kubectl get pods to see those containers. So I have here the two replicas and the MySQL that I previously deployed. I can even follow the logs of them so kubectl logs dash f and the name of the pod so i can see here that the application is started but the purpose of the replication controller is to keep always true replicas running so suppose let me do here the following thing Oops. What I will do now is to kill one of this process. So let me execute a terminal inside one of this uh, Java process. As you can see, I have here a the JBoss the JBoss process running the Java process. I will do a kill one. It killed the process, but immediately Kubernetes started a new one. If I do a kubectl get pods, I can see that I have now two pods running. It restarted the existing pod again. That's the purpose of replication controllers. But now this container uh, it could be, suppose that I have multiple mo nodes and if the no entire node crashes down, it will re recreate this pod in another node and very likely with an, a different IP address. So to use this service, I can't rely on the IP of these pods. I, the, I like to create an abstraction to access those containers and that's the purpose of Kubernetes service. So what I will do now is expose this replication controller using the port 8080. And when I do that, I create a, a service that it, it has its own IP address. So when I access this service, it will be, it will do a load balancing between these two or 10 or a thousand pods that I can execute at the same time. Another nice feature about uh, having service is that it allows me to have an easy service discovery. For example, as I told you, I have here uh, MySQL uh, my database running. This Java application connects to this MySQL, but how can I find this in this cluster? 
So let me show you how I can do that. Something that I can do with um, Kubernetes or with, with OpenShift, besides reading the logs here in the uh, web terminal, I can open a new terminal and type commands like for ex the, the one that I did, I can see the process, but I can also ping my, uh, my service, which is called MySQL, because uh, inside the cluster, I have a software-defined network. Uh, another thing that I can could use to locate this database running is use environment variables. So among this envir the environment variables that were created, I have the MySQL service host or MySQL service port. Let me see if I have also the guest book. Uh, no, the guest book will have the on the next on the next pod. Well, this is one of the easiest way to c create con uh, containers. But what I like to do is to keep the definitions of these pods and ports and 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 labels running inside files. Because, for example, I would get here the next service that I want to run. I want to run the front end to access this back end service in Java. Instead of typing kubectl run, the name of the image, the name of the, por the, the port, I prefer to keep it inside a YAML file because there I can store that in, in GitHub I can uh, version that, I can s easily add labels, I can easily change the replicas and change all the met metadata. And suppose that I want to run now the other parts of my application. It will be easy as do a kubectl create specifying the files. The front end replication controller and the front end service I have another microservice here called Hello World Replication Controller and, repli and its service. And when I do that, with a single command, it will read all of those files and create these uh, microservices for me. So as you can see, it will restart. You can easily see the image that it was used, the image that were used here. And now I need to access this application. Something that I can do with OpenShift is create a route that so I can access with my browser inside this container. So let me use it here. I will give it a name, for example, let's say Java 1. And I will use a, a, uh, an external DNS here. 10122nip.io. It's an, in nip.io is a service that resolves to any IP address that I place it here. Once that I create the route, I can just click here at the host name that I specified and I have the application running. So it's a very very simple application. Let's let's do some tests here. Hi, my name is Rafael and the message is welcome to Red Hat Booth. This triggered this access the guestbook service and the Hello World service in my application. But you might wonder that sometimes containers are um, supposed to be ephemeral. I have a, data, a database running here. What would happen if this my SQL died. Let's do the same thing. Let's kill this container. So let's get the pod. Let me access inside the pod, create a bash. PS AXU. Let's kill my SQL. And yeah. You can see the replication controller detected that my SQL died and restarted it automatically. But le let's try to use our application again. Uh, this is my 
this is a new test and as you can see it restarted reload the same database because inside this pod I have a percent volume that keeps my data so no matter how how many times I kill no matter how many issues the this application can face the replication controller will always keep it running If you want to know more about Kubernetes, I like to invite everybody here to join a uh, three hours lab where we will go through each one of these details of Kubernetes. We will also show OpenShift that I just presented here to you. It will be na uh, na tomorrow on, on, the Hilton on the Hilton here on Franciscan Room C and D. You are very welcome to be there. Don't forget to subscribe at developers.redhat.com and if you have any questions, any feedback of this presentation, please feel free to add me at Twitter. My Twitter handle is Rafa Bene and I really like to thank you the presence of all of you here. Thank you.